if you're so this okay the meeting is being recorded um a, a second point is that we are deviating a bit from this model that Nick Stanek has, uh, present, has presented as I, RCR as ideal behavior because we do not think that we should narrowly focus on what ideal behavior is or, or that role models as such um, 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 will be definite in, in, in helping you uh, how to become a more responsible researcher, but actually that it is much more fruitful to start somewhere in the middle and help people to move towards more responsible uh, behavior in research and showing that the uh, actual world in which we are living in the academies is not really ideal. So a lot of customs and a lot of institutional regulations are not such that they actually stimulate always the best behavior in researchers. And we all know the examples, I think. So showing people the ideal role model might not be something that they easily identify with, nor is it the, the worst person. So the person who has been misbehaving very much is also in, in training sessions, also not always the best um, uh, uh, role model and the person that they will identify mostly with. So these are two <clears throat> main uh, or important uh, things to remember if I'm talking about RCR and education. Um, so what about empowerment as a leading concept? So we have been diving into the literature and in the literature you can easily <laughs> see that Paulo Freire is one of the first actually to, well, he never actually mentioned the word uh, empowerment, not in his, uh, his book even though he has been considered as the founding father of the empowerment uh, education movement. He has um, um, written the book Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Uh, it's a Brazilian, uh, 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 Brazilian scholar, and he might be familiar with you. And also in the work of Foucault, Michel Foucault, you find a lot of uh, interesting debates on, uh, on uh, empowerment, but I'm mainly focusing actually in this project on, on Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And very interesting is that, well, he describes, of course, a situation where uh, in, in, uh, in, a, in a context, in a world where education is part of a system where many people are oppressed and cannot uh, really develop themselves, um, he thought of a way out of this and he developed this idea that if you really want to, um, and he says, well, the vocation of humanity is to humanize. So we need to get rid of these systems of, of oppressions that are, that are um, uh, present in, uh, at least in, in the Brazil uh, of the time that he wrote this, um, uh, this book. Um, then we need to think of education in a completely different way. So education can play an important role, according to him, in really empowering people and getting rid of these systems of oppression. And, and the means to, uh, to achieve this, um, uh, this empowerment would be to, to use dialogue. And then he has a lot of characteristics about how dialogue needs to look like and what kind of conditions are relevant for that. So, uh, but the main idea is dialogue can help to liberate humans and it will stimulate an epistemological curiosity, you could say, about what uh, dialogue requires. Um, and um, well, basic to his, to his thoughts about empowerment is that people need to become more conscious. So that's the, the, Brazil, the, the Portuguese consensus. I'm not going to pronounce it. Um, so the, the Portuguese uh, word for, for consciousness is really relevant in his, uh, in his work. Because if you become more conscious of your situation and your position in society and what you need to really learn and to become more like a, uh, the human being that, you, that can prosper and, uh, uh, and, and, um, uh, and live the way that you really want to live, uh, that, is, um, uh, that is the first starting point actually to come to a new kind of way how people can be taught and how people can also learn. Uh, so it's both an, uh, an making an appeal to the person who is teaching as well as to the, the person who is being taught. Um, and well, a leading thought that you can, uh, can frequently find in his booklets is uh, that, that he says, well, well, one cannot think for others and others cannot think for me. So a more equal position of both the person who is uh, being taught and the person who is teaching is quite relevant for him. Well, keep this a bit in mind if I'm talking about empowerment, because there are some elements in, in, this, in his way of thinking about um, being oppressed and, and how education can play a role in that to, to, um, to, to, to put an end to that, um, which you can also find in the way that we have conceptualized um, empowerment in our project. 
And well, since Paulo Freire, there has, has been a huge movement in the literature, especially in the educational sciences about empowerment education. And you can also find a lot of empowerment literature in the, in the field of health uh, care. And one author that I've particularly found interesting is one uh, is, is Lawson, who has actually been mentioning three elements of empowerment. He says, well, empowerment can actually be used in three different ways. And it, it focuses on three different types of what you can consider empowerment. And the first, first would be personal effectiveness that mainly focuses on, well, being able to do things yourself. The second would be critical autonomy. Uh, that's more like the ability to think for yourself. And the third would be community, the ability to work with a group to achieve social change. And I think that these three elements are all relevant if you think more carefully about what empowerment entails, because Paulo Freire too, he was, he was actually addressing a system that was unjust. And he tried to change that system and not only the individual who wanted to humanize. So it, it isn't even helping if only single individuals will humanize, but there's something like community also relevant in this concept. So if we move on, so um, uh, what can we consider as core elements that we have been working with in our, in our project and taking from the literature, uh, we have de defined a few core ideas. The first is that empowerment is always in a way, but you have to define it further about taking control or taking power. Um, so it is becoming in control well, when there are situations where you are out of control. It is also often a positive and a proactive concept. So it's focusing on change. It's focusing on improvement in a very positive way, but also active. And then those are also core elements uh, that we would like to use. And there are several levels of empowerment. And this refers to the communal aspect that, um, that Lawson also referred to. Um, in, there are levels of, at the individual uh, level, you can empower or be empowered. At the organizational level, you can empower or be empowered. And at the community level, you can empower or be empowered. And while I'm saying this, is, this is also relevant. Is it that you're being empowered or that you empower yourself? That's an interesting question. I think that Paulo Freire says it is always something that is happening at an equal level. And at the same time in the literature, you find a lot of examples where people say that you need to be empowered and then you might already lose something in the whole notion of empowerment. Because if others determine that you need to be empowered, uh, wasn't that something that you had to decide for yourself as well? Okay, but that's uh, more like uh, a small remark. In uh, our project, we have decided that we uh, want to use these elements. So we want to stimulate reflection in, in research practices with regards to taking control about what one, what one can control and what seems out of control. Um, we also take this positive and pro proactive concept as uh, an, 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 an invitation to focus on good behavior and learning to do things right in a very proactive way. And I'm going to show you in a moment how we have been working with that. And with regards to those levels of empowerment, we think it is really relevant that we do not only train individuals, but also groups, and that we show the bigger and broader system, research groups, institutional contexts um, as well. And that, well, changes need to be made at several levels and that just simply organizing training for one group will not be the end of uh, empowerment in your educational trainings. Um, now a bit of process. So we have first um, uh, found some elements in the literature, um, how we can define empowerment. And we, uh, next to that, we have used the process using the Delphi method to present these core elements from the literature to the consortium partners in our project. And we have been going back and forth to actually come up with a definition of what we can consider core competences of empowerment. And we have uh, developed a list with competences that can be used for all target group, group levels, which is quite challenging still, I think, but we try to do it in such an abstract way that it can be done, but it needs to be um, uh, <clears throat> um, specified for each target group and for each type of course, um, how you uh, conceive empowerment in that particular um, educational context. We have been uh, distinguishing core competences and additional competences. I'm only going to show you the core competences and they, you can't even read them. It's just to show off, of course, that we have this list <laughs> because the letters are too small, but you, you can receive the PowerPoint. You can also receive the model um, uh, afterwards if you like. Uh, we decided not to have it. We decided to, to put a competence model in a kind of a rubric shape. And if you use a rubric shape, you get something like 
uh, insufficient, sufficient or excellent competences. And we decided deliberately not to use that, but say, these are core competences that you can acquire at each level of your education. Only the interpretation and how it is being, um, being taught you can differ in its content or in the context where you are learning. Um, and process-wise, we will uh, also scrutinize this, this list with core competences, again, using the Delphi method, uh, the moment that other teachers are going to use our study materials. And then we will ask their feedback if it is indeed, uh, uh, if indeed they recognize the core competences that we have been defining. Um, there are some rules, of, I think that I'm, I'm going to skip this one because it's much more interesting, okay, um, to see the list. So we made a list of uh, competences, you can't read them, they are too short, I simply copied it from one of our documents, but I'm going to read one to, to you and give you an example. So one core competence that we consider as an example of uh, an empowerment is that you will be able to identify and reflect on relevant RCR aspects in a given situation. And how can you interpret this? Well, consider that you are a student, a high school student, and you were doing some group work, and you encounter a situation of free riding, which is frequently occurs and which is very annoying to most students at all levels, actually. So even if you're, if you're in the high school, you have this experience most likely. Then we think that it is one of the core competences that you learn not simply to condone the situation, but to, that you actively discuss with your group members about this situation of free riding and how you're going to solve this. And now we know that many students are still very uh, passive about this and don't want to discuss this free riding and um, are very loyal to each other. And they find it difficult to, to, to address it to their fellow group members. So you could say to able being able to identify is in, in, in this situation, being able to identify that someone is free riding and not doing her, his or her fair share. And that's, uh, that, that should be um, uh, discussed. Um, so at Utrecht University, we have been responsible to use this competence model and to translate it into uh, PhD tools. And we have been developing three different small private online courses. So a SPOC is a small private online course. And we have developed one on mentoring and supervision. We have uh, developed one on data and research. We have developed one on publication and peer review. And core to each of these SPOCs, and they, I hope that you see how we try to translate this idea of empowerment. Uh, we try to empower PhD candidates. Um, at least we are always focusing on their own research projects. So we ask for their own experiences. We also give them a, an individual portfolio assignment in this course uh, where they have to work on something that is relevant to their own project. Uh, we use a lot of interactions. So we also have group work and discussions where they have to be involved. So the small online course is actually a course where you meet other people. Um, it is reflective. We have developed what we call the RCR reflection model, which is a step-by-step -step approach, very much like the, uh, what uh, all the step-by-step -step approaches that are used in, more, uh, in moral case deliberations as well, but then it's more tailored to RCR discussions. And it is now also interdisciplinary. So what we have been doing so far, we have been inviting PhD candidates from all over Europe to participate. And it's very interesting to see that they really like the interdisciplinary uh, working together because they can already learn a lot from how things are being done in a different discipline, in a different university, in a different research group. And that already helps them to see that things can sometimes be done differently. There is a leading thought in each of these uh, small private online courses, which we also think contributes to the empowerment of students. And maybe the first, I'm only giving, uh, going to give an example now of the first uh, course. I uh, particularly like this one because I think that we are quite successful there. Uh, in the course on mentoring and supervision, we uh, invite the PhD participant in the course to organize uh, an interview or a talk with the supervisor. And it could be uh, additional to the regular meetings you already have. And we invite them to come up with a list of issues that are RCR related that they want to discuss with them. And within the time frame of the course they need to have this talk and in the end there is a live session where they also give feedback about their experience with this interview and how they uh, uh, how they managed and what they talked about and this is really really helping them uh, so what we 
the feedback that we get is that they often did not think about or did not dare to address some of the issues like authorship or uh, how, uh, how they collaborate with other PhDs or how they collaborate in a group because they often do not feel that it is, uh, that it, well, that they can actually discuss these issues because there's either no time or because they think they are too low in the hierarchy to actually address these. And after having had the interview, they sometimes come to the conclusion that their supervisor is also just a human being uh, who struggles with the same issues as they are, uh, that sometimes they come up together with uh, simple solutions to problems like authorship uh, that uh, can easily be solved um, beforehand. And while well, they were still struggling with the question who, uh, for example, what order of authorship should be decided or who, what, who should be an author in a certain publication, etc. So this really helped them. And what was more interesting in this course, also the, the candidates who were less um, courageous to actually address this with their supervisor, the, those persons were coached by the other participants in the course, how they could actually address these issues to their supervisor. And this is really, uh, I think, a good example of making people more proactive um, and stimulating them in a positive way to address some issues that they usually uh, do not have the courage to, to actually address these. Um, and this is a kind of an assignment that is running through the whole course. This is a five-week course where an, at, in the fifth week we actually have this final discussion with them. And this the same, we have an, uh, an individual assignment that tries to empower and activate the students with regards to their own projects and their own problems uh, in the second and third course as well. To give you a sneak preview of the materials, um, this is what the course environment looks like. So uh, it's quite simple course environment actually, and you go through it chronologically. So you start with learning unit zero and every week new materials open up and you can uh, individually go through these materials. You get one week to finish it. And if you either do it on Monday or on Saturday, that's all right by us, except in those cases where there are group assignments. So we do warn them if there is a group in assignment, you have to work together and uh, uh, make appointments with each other to actually do this. Uh, to give a more concrete example, I think you all recognize the colors of the dilemma, the Erasmus dilemma game. We have used a lot of those cases because they're so wonderful to discuss with uh, uh, all levels of uh, students and researchers. And in this case, we have introduced the European code of conduct and we asked them, can you give an example, if you read this case, of something that goes wrong or something that goes right uh, with regards to the principles? So which principles are relevant and uh, why do you think these are relevant? We also have an, uh, an alternative where we discuss the code of conduct and then we ask them which principle, principles apply according to you to your own research project. And is that in a very positive way, something that you really take care of? Or is this something that still needs attention and, and that might... Uh, require some deliberation in the near future. We also have um, had someone who made some cartoons for us. This is on the course on supervision and mentoring. And then we have nine cartoons, you only see six. And they're just a uh, start, uh, uh, starter for, for, the, for the students to, uh, to, to get talking. The idea is here quite simple. We have made um, categorizations of uh, uh, supervision styles. And then we ask them, do you recognize the way in which you are currently being supervised? And then we also ask them, is that also the way that you would like to be supervised or is there a, a difference between that? And if there is a difference, how you, can you explain that? Did, do you dare to address this also to your supervisor? So if someone is uh, only addressing you as a philosopher or as an assessor, um, um, then, and, and there are the, the, the small signs, the, the, the pluses you can uh, push the button to get some more information on each of these uh, these these different styles. Uh, if there is a difference, if you have different expectations, why do you not address this in a conversation with your supervisor? And is there some space to do that? And this is a really lovely assignment, actually. They they really like this because it also makes them think and reflect of their uh, of the way they are being supervised. And we have an additional assignment where we also ask them if you are also supervising junior researchers or master students yourself. What is your own style of supervision and mentoring? And uh, is there a gap between how you like to be supervised and how you actually mentor other people? And if there is a gap, can you explain that? Uh, 
So it's it's not only uh, it, it's go it goes two ways actually. So it's also about your own role in mentoring and supervision others. Well, it's just all a sneak preview. If you want to have a look at the materials, it's always possible. Um, so uh, just make a request. We also made some short videos like the RCR reflection model is being explained in a small video. And we have noticed that that, that, that is not sufficient. So we also need to explain a case uh, deliberation. And, and, and we are now um, adding a written case deliberation to the course material so that the students get an idea of what we actually expect from them. Um, we are a bit overwhelmed by the popularity of the courses, so we open them up for everyone because we also do want to do some research uh, accompanying uh, the courses because we want to know if we are really successful in empowering the students. So which of the competences are successful and which competences uh, uh, are not stimulated at all. So 480 students have, uh, PhD candidates have subscribed so far. They come from everywhere, even outside the consortium. So the word is spreading. And I think if we put it on the embassy of good science that it will even increase more. Um, but also the starting, so it's, it's a bit like a MOOC now. Uh, the numbers of people that are not starting the courses is also quite high. So they are very enthusiastically subscribing, but the moment uh, that the course starts, already 50% of the uh, persons will uh, not start the course. Uh, Mariette, can you uh, come to, uh, to an end? Yeah, because yeah I'm very nearly there. Coming. We're nearly there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the impressions of the students so far, overall very positive. What I really like is the use of cases, working in groups, that it is interdisciplinary, uh, and that there are various activities. Uh, and the effects of the courses, they feel more empowered, they say. We ha also have interviews with them and surveys to accompany that. They uh, feel that their knowledge is increased, uh, that their awareness is increased, and they feel more committed to RCR. And then a few quotes, if you like to see. So finally, we, how do we know if we want to stimulate empowerment, if empowerment is really achieved? That is something that we're currently trying to do research on using a mixed method actually pre and post surveys and we use some course data. So we look at the way that they have, this, have their discussions and we uh, also interview a number of students uh, who participated in the courses. And well, so far our impression is that we are indeed successful in stimulating empowerment. So that was it, my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.